Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History of LA podcast with your host, Jacob Berman. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Rodney Blackhurst, a frequent guest on the channel. And today, we're going to be talking about Platonic parallels to the New Testament. And we're also going to be talking about finding revelation in Plato. And I haven't talked about this in like three years, uh, finding revelation in Plato. The last time I talked about this was with Jeff Tadlock. That's the stairway to reason. I'll have the link in the, in the description below. And uh, there might be another video or two of me talking about it out there. If I do find them, I'll put them down there too. When Dr. Blackhurst's PhD was actually on Plato. And so he knows a lot about Plato. And we talked about a lot about Plato in previous interviews. And um, today we're going to be talking about him yet again. This time we're going to be, we're going to be separating, uh, we're going to be departing from the topic of Gnosticism for a moment to focus more on specific parallels between Plato and the New Testament. Um, before we get into Plato and Revelation, I, I want to ask you, um, in general, what do you think are the most common and most noticeable parallels between Platonic literature and the New Testament in general? Yeah, not the usual ones. Uh, I mean, there's the, it's well established that there's uh, sort of parallels, most of which can be explained by just general background. Um, the Platonic thought, you know, just saturated uh, the Hellenic world. And, um, and so Hellenized Judaism is going to pick that up and reflect that. But I'm more interested in structural parallels. parallels and uh, in particular, um, I've looked at um, uh, my, my work in, in studying Plato was looking at the mythological background to Plato. And I think that there's lots of parallels between that mythologic, those mythological structures and the structures that we find in the New Testament for a start. That's, uh, that's, that's my general thing. And there's also, you know, things like uh, the, the distinctions between um, the soul and the body and that sort of, uh, that sort of dualistic uh, type of anthropology that you get reflected in the New Testament and in, well, just in Hellenic thought in general. But you need to, uh, you need to uh, give an account of it more specifically, I think, rather than just the general. Uh, I mean, there's no, no surprises that the general shapes of Platonism permeates the Hellenic world and go into the Judeo-Christian, Judeo um, both, both in Judaism. Um, I'm particularly interested in Philo-Judaeus, Philo of Alexandria. Um, both in Judaism and then in Christianity. And uh, then, then, of course, it's reflected in aspects of Gnosticism in particular, that uh, dualist, uh, dualist Gnosticism in particular, yeah. And what the, now that we have that uh, covered, I, I, I feel like uh, it's a, this is the perfect moment to dive into Plato and Revelation. Because um, mm -hmm. in Plato's dialogue to Timaeus, he talked about, practically a solar apocalyptic event when Phaethon found out that Helios is his dad, Helios was mm. sun god. He asked him, Hey man, if you're really my father, let me drive this chariot. Chariot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go right ahead. Oh, but bef oh, well, before that, I need, I need to put you in extensive training. Yeah. Uh, like, no, no, do it. Give it to me now. He gets very, gets very mm. impatient and pays the price later. So, okay, mm. I'll give you a quick lesson. Drive the damn thing, and he does it, and uh, loses control of the chariot, and the sun gets too close to the earth and starts setting it on fire. That's right. And, yeah. and then Zeus strikes him down. Mm. So that all. Yeah, so it's, that humanity, it's one of those. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those hubris uh, hubris stories that you know Greek myth is full of it. Uh, Icarus is another one, you know, flew too too close to the sun or or whatever. But this one's uh, this particular one is takes a father and son uh, form that the the precocious son causes um, causes irreparable damage to the to the cosmos uh, in that particular myth. But right. that's one of one of numerous myths that Plato talks about there in the, in the Timaeus. And what he's doing there is he's saying that there's a, there's an ancient background to these myths 
that uh, the Greeks don't understand. And that's sort of where he pulls in the, uh, the Egyptians. He tells the story of Solon going to Egypt and Solon discovering that things that the Greeks thought were myths, the, the Egyptians regard as ancient history. Um, those, yeah. those cataclysms and uh, the and in particular the cycles of time, the idea that there are periodic floods and uh, and periodic restorations. Um, that idea, Plato presents that as Solon going to the Egyptians and recontextualizing Greek myths and the faith on myth is uh, is one of them. Um, and uh, I'd also draw attention to, to from the Timaeus to another dialogue of Plato, um, the statesman, or the politicus, it's called sometimes, um, and the statesman myth. The statesman myth goes with the Timaeus myth, with the mythology in the Timaeus. They're, I think that they're, uh, they're related. Um, and in that myth, what happens is you have stories about how time reversed how yeah. um, the cycle goes along for a certain period of time, then it gradually runs runs slow, and then um, <clears throat> the whole system almost breaks down and Zeus has to intervene, and then he turns it back the other way like a spinning top, and you get time reversed there. So you get different depictions of cycles of time and their relationship with uh, Greek myths. And so the faith on myth is one um, periodic periodic cataclysms um, and then Solon goes to Egypt and learns what the true background to those myths is that's uh, that's what's happening there yeah mm. and the curious thing is is that the the number of horses that pull that pull the sun chariot that fly it around mm. the sky is four horses yes and in other in another Greek uh uh denominations uh they, they they say that zeus and helios are the same god mm. and i couldn't help but wonder if revelation read plato in light of those in, of those different interpretations and thought to himself zeus strikes down his own son Phaethon. zeus helios strikes down his son Phaethon to save humanity yeah yeah that's right and that's right it's like god my god my god why have you forsaken me and jesus dies for the sins of the world to save the human race mm. Mm. it's just that, that's what yeah, occurred yeah, yeah. to me when I put all that together. Yeah, what do you yeah. Think about the, that? The, there's, there's lots of lots of such parallels. There are lots of such parallels. And the basis for the parallels is pretty obvious. I mean, let, let's just start from with the fact that uh, the Christians preserved Plato. Right. Christians preserved Plato. They didn't preserve much. They didn't preserve much else. They preserved Plato and they preserved Josephus and uh, a number of other texts. They didn't preserve, for instance, Epicurus and the Epicureans. Uh, there's right. whole schools of philosophy which are just completely gone and lost. Well, we have a fragment. We have the whole of Plato. Why is that? Because it was compatible with, uh, with Christian views of things. For instance, the myths that we were talking about in the Timaeus are about periodic yeah. flood, floods, uh, f destruction between a cycle of floods and fire. Right. This is uh, this is entirely compatible with a, with a biblical biblical worldview that they can draw parallels between Plato's got a flood and and uh, the Bible has a flood the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures have a flood and uh, there's yeah. the next next uh, destruction will be a conflagration of fire and so forth um, they preserve Plato because it's such a rich parallel with uh, with judeo-christian thinking and so just the fact that they preserved it tells us that there must be a lot of plato in the new testament worldview or at least they regarded it as compatible um but most likely um there's there's very definite borrowing from plato very definite shadows from plato that fall into the new testament and particularly uh what, we, what we're talking about the the apocalyptic stuff yes Mm. Plato's Timaeus is uh, an interpretation of that. It's, it's a source of apocalyptic, yes. Yeah, I think I, I feel like Plato's dialogue to Timaeus uh, like fills in the gaps in the theology. Like, because the thing is, there's the four kingdoms of Daniel, yes, in, in the Old yeah, Testament. Right. But the thing is, I, I don't, well, there's another parallel. 
sorry, there's another no, that's parallel. Fine, that's, fine. That, that's 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 mm -hmm. extremely uh, extremely pl platonic. You know, you have the, the the you have that symbolism of, in Daniel of gold, silver, <clears throat> um, oh, yeah, bronze, yeah. Or iron, all the metals. That's 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 entirely out of Plato. Uh, they're the four four ages of Plato in the Republic, and uh, and then that's connected to the creation myths in uh, in the Timaeus, and the Golden Age degenerates into the Silver Age and so forth. That's the symbolism of Daniel. Yes, um, and in fact, I, I think that Daniel's a late text, and it probably almost certainly has Platonic uh, connections right from the start so yeah, I've, I've noticed for a while that the consensus is that daniel was written sometime in the second century bce yeah yeah that's right i, th I think so uh, i think daniel's a late text uh and it's an extremely interesting text because of that um, right yeah but but it's also one of the most platonic the symbolism in it is very platonic those four four metals and the four ages uh, that's 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 Plato. That goes right through Plato, uh, including the Timaeus, but most most particularly in the Republic, but also again in the Statesman. Yeah, Ovid's Metamorphosis, written like just about the big, right right about the turn of the century, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, right, yeah. right entering the first century CE. He was writing the Metamorphosis, and it has those ages in there. The flood. It's even yeah. it, at one point he even mentions Lucifer. Yes, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like once, that, I remember. Mm, that's right, that's right. Um, there's lots of overlap between these worlds. Uh, uh, and Plato signals that in the, in, in the Timaeus, where he says that Solon went to Egypt. Where did he go? He went to the Delta region. He went to Sais. And uh, Plato draws attention to and names King Amasis and uh, that particular dynasty, the 26th dynasty of the Egyptians. So he, he signals very definite connections there. And, you know, you, you can start to join dots because the city of Alexandria is in that region. And then uh, you have Philo Judaeus and a very large Jewish community and Philo Judaeus, whoever he was, Philo of Alexandria, um, obviously, he's steeped in Plato. Here, here you have a Jewish scholar who is steeped in Plato and who wants to create a, a synthesis between Plato and Moses, between, um, you know, what is, what is Plato but Moses speaking Greek, that sort of, uh, that sort of idea. So, so the, the, the Platonizing of the Judeo-Christian begins with the Judeo, it begins with Judaism. And, but that's, that's right on the cusp of Christianity, isn't it? You know, yeah. philo Judea says right on the cusp of Christianity. Um, and so we can just tell what the intellectual environment was like. Plato is right through that intellectual environment. Mm. Yeah, the parallels seem to be um, quite strong. And, and, the, and the thing is, but the later interpretations of Helios and Zeus being interpreted, reinterpreted as the same God. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it flushes in additional parallels, even stepping outside of Plato, like uh, Dionysus, uh, God of wine, uh, Zeus's son who dies, who also dies and rises again. He's brought on trial before King Pentheus. Yeah. So, some yeah. even claim, Oh, that sounds a lot like Pontius. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then there's, there's That's also right. Pontus, a Greek God. Mm-hmm. That's right. I, I think that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of those sort of echoes and parallels and possible echoes. Um, I'm sort of more interested in the, the structural ones. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, there's been a lot of work done, of course, on, um, on uh, the, the resurrection and the dying God uh, and, and all of that and finding parallels with that in uh, Greek mythology, in um, various myths, uh, the Dionysian and, and so forth. And that's been, there's been a lot of work done on that since the 19th century. You know, what you had there in the 19th century was all scholars in, in Great Britain anyway, um, you know, learnt Latin and Greek, that's your basic education, that classical education of the 19th century. And the other text that you learnt was was the Bible. And so right. it was pretty obvious that they try to match the match the two. And once you started having a, a larger worldview in the 19th century, then people started seeing resurrection gods uh, right through yeah. 
mythology, the Greek mythology, um, but also the local mythology of the Middle East. And, uh, you know, it's obviously not something that just came out of the blue. It's, um, it has a long history, those myths. But they're not the, they're, so they're not the myths that I've actually pursued as such, because I felt that a lot of work has been done on that. And instead, my entry into the New Testament was, was rather different. It's at the other end of the equation, namely not the, the death of Christ, but the birth, the, the virgin yeah. birth story is what, what interests me. Or not even the virgin birth. A lot of, lot of work's been done on that too. Um, I'm more interested in the surrogacy myth that's at the, at the heart of um, the Christianity there, that, that Christianity picks up. And that's that strikes me as very interesting because, yeah, I'll, 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 if I can just sketch that uh, for you, Jacob. What happens is in the Timaeus, in the Timaeus, there is a myth that the Timaeus is built on, and it's the myth of the Acropolis. Plato signals it. He mentions the gods by name. He he talks about the festival that the, the dialogue is set on, and so forth. You can work all of that out. That's very quite easy. The myth involves uh, a situation where Hephaestus, Vulcan, the craftsman god, where he accosts and tries to have his way with Athena, the virgin goddess. Yeah. And inadvertently what happens there is that Athena isn't impregnated, isn't impregnated but Gaia, the earth goddess, is. Mm -hmm. And then Gaia gives birth to the solar child, his name is uh, Erechtheus or Erechthonius. Mm -hmm. It comes under different names. Um, this is a solar child, quite clearly. You can see uh, all sorts of evidence for that. And uh, Athena adopts the solar child as a foster child. So the point of the myth is a surrogacy myth. It, the point of it is to show how Athena can be the mother of the Athenians and yet remain a virgin. And so what you have there is virgin, uh, the virgin mother, Parthenogenesis, the Parthenon. You know, it's the, the central myth of Athens is Parthenogenesis, the, how Athena can be a mother goddess and remain a virgin. Now, that goes into Christianity. When you talk about, when you talk about the, the virgin myth of, of, uh, of Mary, and, you know, those, those Old Testament references in Isaiah and other places and people talk about how they've been fudged and how a maiden becomes a virgin and, and so forth. All of that's, that's right. But That gets me what, to a question just real quick. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, The Septuagint. Because I, I, yeah. I, rec I recently had uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer on and he, he mm. claims that the – yeah, he definitely, uh, he definitely agrees that the, the Christians manipulated the Torah. Uh, the mm. copies of the Torah that they call the Old Testament to, uh, to, to, to Tanakh, I mean, the whole, the whole, the whole thing, mm. uh, parts of it was manipulated to make it look like it foretold Jesus. Yeah. But he thinks the, the alterations in the Septuagint were done by origin of Alexandria after the New Testament was written. Mm. When do you, but do you think there were already mistakes made in the Septuagint prior to the New Testament? Because as far as, I'm, as far as I'm aware of, scholars agree that the Septuagint's edition of Isaiah trans mistranslated the word into Parthenos anyway. Virgin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, I've got I've got sort of errant views on that. I, I tend to think that, in fact, contrary to to what the rabbis might think, I tend to think that the Septuagint is uh, is probably earlier, and uh, possibly. I mean, the, the, there's a reason why the Catholic Church sponsors it. Yeah. There's a but reason why. Before you continue, I just want to say real quick, he's not, he's not disagreeing that it's earlier necessarily, but he thinks origin manipulated it. Manipulated. Yeah, yeah, yeah possibly so. Yeah, or, I mean, that, that's quite likely. I, I haven't looked into that, but that's, mm -hmm. that's quite likely, isn't it? I mean, they, they are going to have... There's slippages between words. There's substitution of words. There's those subtle manipulations of the text that goes on until it's finally set in stone, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so that's what you'd expect. I would expect a certain amount of manipulation of the text so long as it's fluid. 
but as soon as it becomes uh, fixed, you know, in the in the Vulgate or um, it's kind of it's, it's kind of like Psalms twenty two sixteen. Um, mm. Like a lion, they maul my hands and my feet. But in the Christian verse, it says they pierced my hands and my feet. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's yeah. that's uh, that's substitution and slippage and just trying to make the proof text conf- a better proof text for what for your purposes. And that's happening all the time, isn't it? I, I think that that happens all the time. That's, we can just assume it. Yeah, that's why I think one could argue, rightfully so, that the Christian Old Testament and the Tanakh aren't necessarily the same thing. The Christian Old Testament is a modified replica of... Yes, absolutely. uh, Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, and I've never pursued this as such, but I'm curious as to why the Catholic Church clings to the Septuagint. Um, yeah. And they do because because the, uh, the 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 Protestants, of course, the Protestant in the Protestant Reformation, the, one of the first things the Protestants did was attack Jerome, attack the Vulgate, attack the 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 the, the Septuagint, and to say, let's go back to the Jewish texts, let's go back to the original text and not right. the translations. But uh, but the Catholic Church, interestingly, absolutely resisted that, and it seems to me that they they. They know more about the Septuagint than we than they let on. That there's, uh, I'm not convinced about the about the textual history of those in that early period, and I suspect it may actually be the opposite of what we what we think. But I, I'm not in a position to. Um, uh, that's just a suspicion. That's a hunch. In other words, you suspect they're hiding text from us. That's not put in public. They're put in the public eye. That's. Uh... That's more clear on this. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm just curious as to why they they're so attached to the to the Septuagint. Yeah. Why they didn't jettison the, the Septuagint? You know, I'm. I'm I've. Stu- I have done a lot of study on this on that period of the the Reformation period, where the Catholic Church went through enormous pains to try to come up with a new translation Good point. because. Yeah. Because Jerome was just not sustainable, the the attacks on it by uh, the Protestants were devastating, and then they had the whole problem of how do, how do we start again? So how you would uh, again? so you would agree that the Gospel of Matthew, when it cites Isaiah, when it talks about oh, and he shall be born of a virgin, yeah, it's yeah. really citing the Septuagint. Yes, it's not yeah, citing yeah, that's the, right. it's not citing the Tanakh. Yeah, no, 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah. But the relationship between those texts, I'm not sure about. I'm really not sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I suspect it's very different than what we think, but, but I'm not sure. Yeah. But, uh, but just going back to the, to the structural parallels and to the virgin, the question of the virgin, what interests me there is that you get the same configuration in Christianity. So what you get, except in Christianity, you, you've got a surrogate myth but it's a surrogate father myth. And interestingly, the, the clue here is that Joseph, the erstwhile father, is described as a techne. He is a craftsman. Tacton, yeah. Yeah, traditionally, traditionally, uh, traditionally, you know, traditionally people say he's a carpenter. Yeah, uh, he's a manual worker. He's a manual worker. He works with his hands. That's what it means. And so you've got the same configuration. You've got the same configuration. You've got the craftsman God in the Plato myth that produces a virgin birth. And you've got a craftsman in the Christian story as well. You've got the same elements, except this is a father surrogacy rather than a mother surrogacy, but with the same outcome, a virgin birth. In, in both cases. And so I'm interested in the, I think there are really deep structural parallels between those texts in that way that, mm. we, that we, we don't appreciate because we haven't really understood the myths in Athens that are being, that are the structures that are being put into the New Testament story. Mm. Curious. Could Revelation 22.16, when it makes the odd statement that Jesus is the son of David and Lucifer. Could that mm. be, could, could that statement be connected to Plato's dialogue of time? Yes, because it, because Phaethon was Helios's son 
He brought yeah, the yeah. sun too close to the earth. He was burning the damn thing. And and Helios in later text was confused with Zeus. So yeah. that's that's what's making me think like <laughs> I think so. I yeah, I I think yeah. so. Uh I think so, Jacob. I haven't I haven't really delved into that, but but just on a on a in a general sort of way, um, that's a Luciferian sort of myth, isn't it? The faith on mm. myth, namely that uh, uh, in if if you're a, if you're in the Judeo Christian world and you're reading that myth, yeah. how are you going to identify it? It's uh, yeah, that's right. It's Luciferic. Um, and what's and, interesting is I tend to think like maybe we could do more shows on this. Is that the Sumerian parallels of the Greek myths, like the oh, yeah. Ut, Utu, the Sumerian sun god, he had a chariot called a Bunena, a Bunena, mm. uh, who appears to be his son. Mm. He doesn't have, I think he was an, I think Phaethon is probably based on him, but the Sumerian mm. version of, the, of, 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 of this god does not have this apocalyptic story where he screws up and brings the sun too close to the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems yeah. to, if it is the same God, the Greeks obviously made some uh, elaborations that were not very originally. Uh, addition mm. of, uh, of uh, this is the story. Even the Hindu sun god Surya has mm. a chariot called Aruna. Mm. And so, so the sun god yeah, yeah, has, a, yeah. has a driver. This, a, a this material driver. in Plato. This yeah. material in Plato, and what let's 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 go through it. What you got is yeah. a structure where you've got four ages, and then there's destructions in between each of the four ages, and they go in cycles between fire and water, between conflagration and flood, in between. Uh, you, so you get that structure, that general structure. Now that general structure is found right through the Indo-European uh, mythology. You know, it goes into uh, uh, H- Hinduism um, and uh, oh, yeah. through per- Persia and uh, and elsewhere. It's a very widespread sort of at mythology point, or mythological structure. Yeah. At, some point, I, we, we, at some point, I definitely would like to do with you a whole show on that because I, I, I've been meaning to get into Proto-Indo-European oh, yeah, yeah, myth yeah. for some time. But yeah, I haven't yeah. gotten around to it. But go, yeah, continue. Sure. I don't want to. I don't want you to lose track. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, there's a surprising amount of foreign stuff in Plato. Plato, you know, is you know he writes in perfect Greek, and he's a loyal Athenian, and uh, all of the rest. But he's also a cosmopolitan man. You know, after the death of Socrates, he disappeared for twenty years or so, and we're not sure where he went. But uh, all sorts of rumors that he traveled here and there, you know, the stories he went to India. And, but he probably did go to Egypt. That's, that's likely, it seems to me, possibly through the Middle East, possibly uh, further on. Also, you have to remember that uh, the Greeks had had wars with the Persians earlier, um, just before this. And so there's a surprising amount of Persian stuff in Plato. You know that they took from the they they vanquished the Persians, brave little Athens, but uh, but actually um, Persian ideas were go right through uh, Greek ideas at that point, and in Plato in particular, the math system base sixty, you know it's Babylonian, it's Middle Eastern, um, but this mythic structure, uh, it's there in. Yeah, it's there in Hesiod. There's elements of it in Hesiod and so forth, but it's a much wider mythology. It's a mythology that goes right uh, through the Indo-European world, and arguably it goes back into prehistory. Uh, that that type of mythology, although it's of course a metallurgic mythology, so uh, it's it can't be before metallurgy, I guess. And now that you brought up the flood myth earlier, I I what occurred to me is like. Ovid's metamorphosis, I remember it talking about that it's quoting Jupiter and it's saying that he will n- he will never flood the world again, but he will mm. reserve it for his lightning bolts, fire. That's right. Like, that's right. I'm like, that reminds me of the book of Genesis where God, when the when Certainly God does. says that he will reserve the world for fire. I'm like, because I don't yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't I don't know of a I don't know of a flood myth where it contains a saying like that before Genesis. And it yeah, makes me yeah. wonder if the reverse is happening in this instance, or, or instead of, but not reverse. I mean, what I mean to say is that Ovid is borrowing from, could yeah, Ovid yeah, be yeah. borrowing from Genesis a little bit? To, 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 uh, no, more, more likely he's coming, going through plates. Oh, yeah, possibly, possibly so. Yeah. I'm not sure. At, by is that, that point, he, he may well do. Yeah, he may well do at that point. Yeah. Because he'd, he'd be, uh, he, 
the text would be available, certainly, yeah. 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 It's been by that point, it's been there for like hundreds of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. waiting. <laughs> that's right. But you know, if you if you're uh, if you're in that Judeo-Christian world and that mindset, let's say you're living in Egypt and you're Jewish, like Philo Judeus, when you read Plato, it's a gold mine of parallels oh, between yeah. the book of Genesis. And you got floods and fires and you got mythological. Interestingly, I mean, there's different types of Plato. There's different Platos. And I'm particularly interested in the cosmological Plato. There's a cosmological and apocalyptic Plato that you get in the Timaeus and a couple of other places, the statesman myth and others. That's very different than the, you know, the ethical, political Plato you get in the Republic and elsewhere. There's a there's a cosmological Plato um, that that you find in Philo Judeus, and you find it elsewhere. The the mythology actually spreads. Look, in a later period, it spreads right through Anatolia and through Asia Minor. Um, there's a cult of Plato. And the, the Plato that's concerned is the Plato he, who is the great chronologist and the great geographer and the great hydrologist and the great, uh, the, 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 the man of the, the great historian, the one who understands the cycles of time and ancient history. That's the Plato that was revered in this period. Not the Plato that we know, not the Plato that we value through, you know, sort of through the Phaedo and uh, that psycho psychological uh, doctrine of the soul and all of that sort of stuff. That's a very different Plato. And uh, the, the, the utopian Plato of the Republic, that's a very different Plato. Uh, and indeed, the Plato of the Symposium, the Plato of Platonic love and all of that, that's a very different Plato too. What they do is they take the Timaeus and actually the, the, the construction they have is they regard the Timaeus as the central text and the supplementary text as the Parmenides that provides the metaphysics that goes with the cosmology. And they sort of uh, put those two things together as a set. And so that's the Plato that I think we find in the New Testament and the background to the book of Revelation, John of Patmos, uh, all of that. That's a, this is a Greek speaking world that is seeped in that sort of material, but it's very particularly that Plato that they have. I call it the cosmological Plato. It's the Plato of the Timaeus and the Critias. So you also get, uh, and part of that ensemble is um, is the Atlantis story and the idea of a, mm -hmm. a, a lost a lost heritage, a, a buried heritage, or a, a lot you know a lost continent and and all of that. And it's only relatively uh, recently that people have actually thought that that was an archaeological challenge, and they got in submarines and went looking for it. In the, in the ancient world, it's clearly connected to the cycles of floods and conflagra yeah. conflagrations and uh, that Egyptian vast chronology and so forth. That's the Plato that uh, goes into the New Testament, right. in my opinion. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks for joining me once again, Dr. Blackhurst. This has been a great discussion on Plato. And next time uh, we talk, I'd like to cover dying rising gods, including... One yeah, startling, sure. ridiculous comment that Justin Martyr said about, mm. uh, oh, it's actually the other way around. Uh, demons created the other religions to make it look like <laughs> Christianity yeah, yeah, borrowed yeah, from yeah. them. Let's, yeah, let's save that for next time. That's going to be okay. fascinating to talk about. Well, thanks, sure. for, thanks for coming on again, Dr. Blockers. Okay, cheers. Thanks, uh, thanks for your time, Jacob. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.